Hello guys, welcome back to our study of John. Today we're going to look at John 10, 17 through 21. Last week, or uh, it's been a little bit since we met, but last time we saw 11 through 16, and we were able to learn a lot, what it means to be a shepherd, hireling, and all these other things that, you know, we're still, we're still seeing the same passage. Jesus is still talking about the same thing. Today, we're going to focus on something a little bit different, but he's still following the same thought process, and he's going to continue in 22 and on, but right now, uh, we're just going to read this passage and uh, pray and start the study. I'm going to I'm gonna read from 11, just so that it makes a little bit more sense where we're at. Um, so 11 through 21, <laughs> I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, but a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I'm known by my own. As the father knows me, even so I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep and other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore, my father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my father. Therefore, there was a division again among the Jews because of these sayings. And many of them said, he has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Lord, thank you once again, because we're able to be here together, gather, to be able to learn more about you, God, because you are the way, the truth, and the life, God. You are the door and you are the shepherd. And there's no other means. There's no other ways outside of you, God. And we have come to understand that. So help us to put our trust in you and you alone, because you're the only one that knows what's best for us. Help us not to trust in people or in men or in women or all the, all the things around us, but in you. Because if we put our trust in you, we will have complete certainty that we know what the path is and we know the truth. So help us to listen to your words and to understand them. Um, and everything else, all the opinions or our thoughts or, or questions, God, that you may be able to answer them, that you may be able to teach us, and so that you may lead us to life, because that's our purpose. We want to believe in you, trust in you, and keep seeking you. Uh, even, even though we are not the best, we are not perfect, we know that we depend on you, and that's, that's what you want. It's for us to know our dependence on you. So thank you in the name of Jesus. Let it be you who leads us in the study and let, let it be your words and your spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Amen. All right, guys. So let's get back on kind of like, we, we just read it, but um, what is the context? What have we been learning throughout this chapter 10 of John? Well, uh, in, Jesus. In, your, in your own words uh, in your own words and in, in in the understanding that you have been able to acquire for yourself what would you say about this chapter about what we've been seeing so far well Jesus is the good shepherd and that uh, he leads us and, um, and guides us in our, in our walk in our life he guides us as what i mean he guides us as a shepherd yeah we are the sheep we're the sheep and there's those that think they're the shepherd right and it's about recognizing and always just remembering that jesus is a true shepherd and not people like for example well in the in the reading People like um, the Pharisees, the false prophets. Um, so it's 
really focusing on where you're putting your trust and knowing what is just remembering the true purpose of your walk and faith. The two things that I do want for us to have for sure is this relationship that Jesus has with the sheep and the sheep has with the shepherd, right? Jesus being the shepherd, of course. And, and I think that's the most valuable thing that we're going to learn in this chapter um, is the fact that the sheep, the ones that believe in him, the ones that know him, they follow his voice and they go where, they, where he tells them. In the same sense, the shepherd knows his sheep and he lays down his life for them. That's what he wants to do for the sheep because those are his sheep. He has a relationship with them and he loves them and takes care of them. That we can have for certain. I don't need an interpretation. <laughs> I don't need to like try to guess what that means because it's right there. It's very clear. You know? He has a relationship with his fold and there's one fold and one shepherd. There's not multiple, multiple, there's not a lot of shepherds, there's not a lot of folds, it's just one shepherd and one sheepfold or one flock, as it says. So that I think is one of the emphasis that I do want us to understand, which obviously leads us to see what, you know, Jose was talking about just now. Um, if we say that anybody else is our shepherd, if we put our trust in anybody else but the shepherd, then we're making a big mistake. Uh, in the end, if, the, if there's people that work for the shepherd, they are higher hands. They're only hirelings. They could try to care for the sheep, but they're not going to care as much as the shepherd. I, I won't say that they won't care at all. Because in the end, when you work, when you do something, you end up caring for it. Uh, it's, this, it's the fact for my job. I mean, in Publix, as I was talking about last time, I try to do my best because I do like the people that I work with. I do like the place that I work with. I appreciate the place because really, it's, it's really good. I mean, at least to me. Uh, so I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take care of it as well as much as I can. But it's nowhere near to what probably the store manager or even like somebody that actually put their money or whatever. I don't know how that necessarily works, but someone that actually owns or like cares for it more so than me because it's their baby or is their business or is theirs. You know, it's not mine. There's more on the line. Yeah. There's more in the line. Exactly. Uh, not to say that we don't have a lot of the line here, but our job is easier. Our load is easier. You know, because in the end, we're not the shepherd. And that's something that's it's very clear in the text that we've been reading. If anybody else says that they're the shepherd, it doesn't make any sense. There's only one shepherd. And that's one of the things that I think it's important for us to understand throughout this whole chapter. Uh, because sometimes we do want to be the shepherd. Sometimes we do want to be the one that's above, that's, you know, telling everybody what to do, that thinks that they own this place. And but they really don't. No. It kind of it kind of brings me back to one of the. I, I know this is like going out of like John, but in another gospel, uh, Jesus told talks about a parable, where he talks about that this man he owns a vine, right? This whole vine, it's his. It's his property. It's his business. It's his. But yet he gives it to other people to work the vine. And they work the vine. But then when the actual owner tells, tells like his, his servants that he has to go over there and get what is his, right, from the vine. And when he, they go and try to do as the master tells them, the people that are working in the vine decide to beat them up and to almost kill them because they want to take advantage and they want to basically have the vine for themselves so then the master goes and sends his own son thinking that they're gonna have respect for him that they're gonna you know care for him but when his son comes they beat him and they kill him and because they think oh now this is gonna be our property 
but that's not the case. In the same sense, this business is his and we are still just hirelings. He's going to hire somebody else new after he destroys those evil workers that killed and destroyed. And those new people that are going to come in, he's going to uh, also hire. But in the end, the vine is still his vine. It's not ours. His vine yard. That's really the word. It, it, I think it's very similar to what we're seeing right here. Not completely, but it, it, it gives the same uh, type of message, right? Don't, yeah. don't, don't usurp something that's not yours. Right? The king here is God. The one that owns this whole thing is God. So if you start trying to treat it like your property, like it's yours, and that you've done anything to deserve it, well, that's not true. But I'm, I'm getting on a topic, but I feel like this has been like something that I've seen in this last three weeks, especially studying this passage that just sounds so important to me. Because it's kind of like Jesus is trying to make an emphasis, and I think the emphasis is very clear. This is his work. This is his business. This is his life. This matters to him a lot, a lot. So if you start messing with it, thinking that you own it, you're, you're walking on thin ice. And I wouldn't want to be in those shoes. And we need to understand that. Sometimes we want to like have everything on our control in our hands. And I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm supposed to do. I know what I, what, what I need to say and who do I need to say it to. I, I know where I'm supposed to run to and walk to. But sometimes you're not listening. And you need to listen to what God is telling you. He's the master here. You're not your own master. You're not your own Lord. I was taking, yeah. I was taking a test yesterday at my work. And one of the questions was, um, do you feel, it was like, do you feel that um, people's lives are determined by random events and occurrences? Or do you think people control their own destiny? And since those are the only two options, I was like, people control their own destiny, but it's God that controls. Right. It's God's timing. It's, it's, it's interesting because in the end, really, obviously, it's not people. No, right, it's, obviously we don't, uh, Jesus is not a Calvinist. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you guys heard that before. <laughs> I thought it was funny. Uh, this theologian said that, hey, did you know that uh, Jesus was a Calvinist <laughs> and I thought it was funny because John Calvin came way way long like way after Jesus uh, mm -hmm. no, Jesus was his own thing but the fact of the matter here is that yeah God lays down the work God lays down everything he created everything but in the end he gave you free will to do what either good or bad to either believe in him or not believe in him because if he forced you to do so, then it wouldn't be love. He wouldn't love you and you wouldn't love him. But if you decide to give your life to, for, to him, it's because you love him. And because you really, in, in the midst of everything, in the midst of who you are, you still decide God is more important than my life. God is more important than what I want. And this yep. is the choice that I'm going to make. But... In the end, obviously, we know, God, help me. <laughs> help me because I need your help. I can't make this decision on yep. my own. But it's, it's for you to have that desire to make the right decision. It's for you to have that desire to choose the right thing. Yep. Be, be not only a hearer, but a doer of the word. So, but obviously, we know that... Faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of God. That's what the Bible says. We have to hear the word. <laughs> Otherwise, how are we going to believe? So, yeah. So I just wanted to make that, you know, an emphasis. I think Jesus has been making it this whole chapter. He's going to still talk about it later on. But here's going to talk about it on a different topic. And um, you guys have anything else perhaps that I missed about the context, about what we've been seeing? Or we're good to move on?
It's looking good. All right. Let's start with verse 17. Therefore, doth my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. All right. So from seeing the context, right? Here, Jesus is saying, therefore, my, my father, what? He loves me. He loves me. Because he does what? Because I lay down my life. I he give it to down. the father. He lays it. down his life. To do what? What is he going to do afterwards? So that he might take his life again. He's going to take it again. I, I, I give it up so that I might, so that I um, show my dedication and then my life will be given back to me. Right. Kind of uh, going off topic, it kind of reminds me of, once again, names are terrible. He had, he had to sacrifice his son, but an angel stopped him and offered him, gave him a sacrifice. Who was that? That was Abraham. Yeah, no, thought Isaiah. so. Okay. I mean Isaac. Isaac. <laughs> Isaac. It was Isaac. Yeah, Isaac and Abraham. Okay. Abraham and Isaac. Isaac and Abraham. Okay. It's kind of. It's, I think it's kind of kind of like that. You have to be willing to lay down your life before God will say that's enough. You can take it back again. You know. Right. Right. Obviously, in the end, God doesn't want to destroy your life. He wants to give you life. But for you to do that, you have to be willing to give it up. <laughs> It's kind of weird how that works, but I think that's a good way to live your life. If you're willing to let go of something, even though you love it and you want it, I think that's for the best because in the end, you're not a slave to it. You're not a slave to that, even if it's good, even if you think that it's good for you. And this goes with, uh, with the passage that talks about that if you love father and mother more than me, you're not worthy of me. And that pa and that passage is like I don't want you to hate your your family. I just want you to love me more than your family. You know, you don't have to do one, and you know, do the opposite with your family. It's right. like we both can happen. You know, but it's the fact that you you do have to make that choice. Right? What's yeah. more important to you? Yeah, because ultimately, if you love him more than your family, when he tells you to do something and your family says, don't do that, you'll listen to Jesus. Right, exactly. And he, and he knows what's best. So, yes, God is not Satan. God's not the robber or the wolf here in this uh, situation. He doesn't want to destroy your life, but he wants to give it meaning. And here more so than anybody in this world, really. Actually, unlike anybody else in this world, Jesus himself said, I am willing to give my life. Uh, I'm willing to take to lay it down for these people. And, and this is important because what, is it, what does it say in 18? No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have power to lay it down and, I, and power to take it up again. This command I have received from my father. So here Jesus is telling us that he does this on his own. Like no one is taking his life. Once he dies, as he's been saying, well, actually, I don't know if he's been saying it yet in John. No, no, no. I think he does in uh, chapter eight when he's talking with his brothers. But, uh, Actually, no, John has been saying that the time has not come yet. His time hasn't come. And meaning his death. So he is going to have to lay down his life. The thing that he's making sure that we know is that nobody is taking this. Nobody is taking his life. So yes, basically saying nobody's more powerful than him. It's just that he himself is laying down his life. By his choice. He has the power to lay it down. And at the same time, in the same sense, he has the power to take it again. Mm -hmm. And when you lay down your life like this, you give it to God, you also allow God to uh, bless you in a sense, because once God, once you've done this, you're doing what God wants. And as such, he doesn't abandon you, allowing him to bless you because you're doing his work you know right but 
have for sure that this whole ceremony or how do you call it this whole situation that jesus is going to go through is no easy it's not easy and it's not fun in fact uh if we look later on i don't know if you read the gospels before i mean you guys probably did but uh when you read his story and when you read the ending it it's uh it's interesting i think he says my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death stay here and watch with me he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed <laughs> this whole situation was not at any point or any way fun for him was this one he was uh, caged or when was this no this was uh, matthew 26 he was about to be uh turned into the, the pharisees by uh judas <clears throat> yeah uh was it oh he's so he was about to be put into jail then right? yeah he was about to be yeah and he he was with his disciples um and he was like, just pray with me, you sit here while I go and pray over there. Yeah, he, he's like, I know what's coming and I, and I really don't like it. Please be with me. Right. It says right here that my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Honestly, that sounds like depression. I don't know if you guys have depression before. but Well, considering he probably knew what was going to happen, you can't blame him. Uh, right. Exactly. It's just like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you've ever thought of your, like to yourself. You have to make a choice that is extremely, extremely sad to you. Like it just saddens you deeply. <laughs> right. uh, honestly, that happens to me all the time. Because <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, I know what I have to do and I really don't want to do it, but I'm going to do it because I think it's the right thing to do. <laughs> yeah, And it sucks. I mean, <laughs> as you guys know, with my, uh, my weakness, all the times that I had to say no to something that I wanted, dude, extremely, extremely sad. And it, it, it kind of like started like that feeling of depression. Like, why do I have to make this choice? And I think that's a feeling that a lot of people actually go through. It's not like, oh, just us, but it helps us understand his perspective in that moment, right? It's not a, it's not a pleasant moment by any means. <laughs> It's not pleasant to do the God, the will of God all the time. It's not. I mean, I would be lying to you if, it, if I tell you that it would be. There's going to be moments where it's going to be, this is not pleasant at all. Uh, in fact, Jesus is going to start saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. <laughs> right? I think this is one of the you know if you pray like jesus prays i think you're gonna be set for life you can you can tell god what you want to do you can tell god what you hope that would happen but in the end in your prayer you should always end god but let it not be my will let it not be how i want it to be but how you want it to be because in the end i know that you know what's best even <laughs> even if i have to this go through this excruciatingly excruci how do you say excruciatingly it? excruciatingly terrible pain and suffering that i'm about to go through my my disciples betraying me leaving me the people of israel the people that i care for that i've been with from the beginning spitting on me hating me even though i've been only trying to do good for them being beaten by the romans and eventually being crucified naked naked he was his it's not like in the movies where just like a loincloth he was naked he was shamed you know that's not a situation that you just like happily walk into <laughs> yeah absolutely <Woo. laughs> no no it's terrible and he knows what's about to happen he knows it because he is the word of god he knows what God has talked about, what the prophecies were, and how he was going to have to be crucified. And this whole situation was going to happen. Yet he himself laid down his life. I, he did that. I'm going to lay down my life. 
and the Father has given me the power to do so. Uh, and I think it's, it's really interesting because nowadays, I think a lot of Christianity tells you it's time to stop suffering, right? God wants you to be a champion, a king, a princess. <laughs> well, if you want to be a king, if you want to be a princess, know that you're going to have to suffer just like the king suffered. I mean, there, there's, a, there's an old joke uh, that I heard. It's a bit of a long one. Okay. It, was talk, it was a joke about, a, uh, maybe it's more like a parable. I don't know. Uh, once there was a, a fisherman who was, you know, fishing along the riverside and he caught a magic fish and the fish said, and his fish said if you let me go, I'll grant you a wish. He says, okay, uh, I want to, I don't like my life. I'll, I want to live it as like a duke. So the fish grants him his wish, and now he's a duke. And then he's, he's he uh, something bad happened, and he didn't want to like his life. He's like he goes back and catches the fish again. Same same uh, wish scenario plays out, and he goes, "I wish to be uh, royalty." And then uh, he becomes royalty. He didn't like that. He made a mess of things. And he's like, I, "Oh, okay, I want to be a king." He became king, made a mess of that. He goes, I want to be, I want to be, live as God lives. And he came back as a fisherman because <laughs> that's how God would live, the, the nice, peaceful life. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, I mean, right. if you, if you want to live as, if you want to live in the status of God, if you want to be a God among men, then, then you're going to have to live as God did. But know for a fact that you're never gonna be God. That's not your. That's not your paper. That's not. How do you say? That's not your script. <laughs> Stick to the reality. You're a human being. You're not a god. You're not a whatever you think that your ego wants you to be. <laughs> uh, seek not the things of this world. The things that will make you happy are the things that everybody, especially nowadays, says um, you should go after. You know, as we say. Money, women, booze, drugs. That's what people say makes you happy. But the thing is, happiness never came from physical things. It came from spiritual things. And there's only one, one master of the spiritual. Yeah, I, I heard a quote one time. It was like, it was as simple as sin was never happy, the way to happiness, you know? And a couple of talks back, we always talk, Santiago was talking about jesus relating uh spiritual things to food and drink and he himself said um like i have food and drink that you don't know anything about it's the same thing with drugs it's like oh i i, I have all these drugs it's like yeah but did they they satisfied you now but are they actually satisfying you look at yourself two years in the future will you still be satisfied or will you still be doing drugs i have a and excuse me for this edgy way of putting it. I have I have drugs that will satisfy me forever. I don't need your drugs. <laughs> I don't know if I wouldn't want to call you that, but I guess I, I, I'm just trying to like connect the dots. So I, I know that's not that's not a good analogy, but I'm like I was talking about drugs, so might as well go all the way. <laughs> um, whatever, let, let Jose talk, want... Evan. I'm sorry. <laughs> My main point was, I yeah. mean, you better, do you want temporary fulfillment or do you want eternal fulfillment? Right. Do you want to chase something that's forever or do you want to chase something that's just for the now? Let that like, shape your motivation towards what you're actually want to chase towards in life, in this life that we have, yeah. you know? The, the main the main issue I think is um, it's when and I think it's happening today it's when Christians uh, start being unable to discern the difference um, because they think both uh, correlate or go with each other uh, and that's how you know that God is blessing you and um, it, it goes with this talk of uh, prosperity and it goes with this talk of uh, God just wants to give me the world and wants the best for me, even if I'm still uh, what I am, even if I still am in this world. In the sense of, for example, I could, 
I could try to argue with you, right? That God wants me to have uh, multiple women, right? He, he's okay with me having polygamy, uh, being married to multiple wives, multiple wives. Yeah. I could try to argue with you all that I can uh, being as maybe that that could be like someone's biggest desire. And uh, being in the church, I could try to tell you that, right? God is okay with that. But I think any of us, and even anybody listening, would absolutely say, that doesn't make any sense. That's not coherent. It's not biblical. And specifically with the, with, with the mindset of sexuality, um, and more, uh, sexual immorality, adultery, and uh, idolatry, right? With all those things in mind and that we've seen in the gospel, it, it's not coherent. It's not okay. It, it's never going to be okay. It doesn't matter what you think or what you say. Having sex with multiple women is not the way that God wants you to live your life. But being as someone, you know, that makes sense, right? That makes sense. But yeah, when we talk about something like, for example, money and fame, that's not as simple anymore. And that, that is not as simple as saying, God is not okay with me having a lot of, a lot of wives or a lot of women. I don't know. And, but yet it's the same thing, you know? And that's where I'm like, how, where do you draw the line? How does that make any sense? If you, got, if you think that God wants for you is money and fame, then you're not coherent. If we can understand that adultery is adultery and sexual immorality is sexual immorality, no matter how you look at it, then we also look at money and at fame, and that's a different type of lust. It might not be a lust as ugly as perhaps having multiple women as it is for the world, but it's still a lust and it's still worthy and it's still something that we shouldn't seek for. What you're seeking in the, in the kingdom of God is for you to have money and for you to have fame. It doesn't make any sense. It's, you're still worldly. <laughs> you're, you're not spiritual. So I think that a lot of Christians are, have like a, how do you call it? Tunnel vision, <laughs> I guess. And they think that being blessed by God and being living spiritual life means that you're also just going to have you're going to have that and it's okay with God. It's okay for you to have fame and it's okay for you to have money because those, those are good things. Okay, well, for me, having multiple women is a good thing as well. Why can't I have that? Okay, it's not okay. <laughs> no, it's not okay. So I think that's one of the things that we can get corrupted with. A thing of the world is still a thing of the world. <laughs> Don't get it twisted. Even if you end up having money or having fame, it doesn't mean that that's what's godly. <laughs> well, even referring back to this chapter and be a little bit beyond, uh, a good a good father and a good shepherd, of course, wants you to to help take care of your physical needs, and that's not a problem. If God wants to bless you with, like, let's say, a job, He's done that for me at one point, then that's fine. But at the same time, there are other blessings which he'd much rather you have that you have to uh, be willing to um, seek and accept, you know? Right. Right. Of course. I, I need money to be able to pay for my bills, pay, pay for my gas, pay for my food, and pay for my house. Absolutely. That makes sense. I need a job to be able to work and earn a pay and earn a, che uh, a check. Right. That's true. And God absolutely wants to give you that. But the problem here is once you start stealing from people, uh, telling them that God is going to bless them by taking their money and uh, that, you know, not just that, but the money that you use, you use it on a six-star hotel or a private jet to, to go somewhere else. And that's not coherent. You don't need that money to do that. You can take an econo economy flight you can stay at a normal hotel and you can eat the normal food as everybody does. I mean, what you're describing there is literally, as I'm sure we've said it quite a lot, many times is humility. 
and that's the that's often the problem with blessings it's not the blessing that's the problem it's a person's heart it's how a person reacts to it and that's why one of the sticking points we always talk about is meekness and humbleness because it's very easy that once god blesses you that you forget that it was god that made it happen and thus you lose your humility right but at the same time we can't forget that we are human beings i mean give a million dollars to anybody today and see if that person doesn't change they're going to change even even something is going to change within them because that is something that is so ingrained in us as human beings as as animals that we are that I don't know. I've seen so many people that have received like the winnings from the lottery. And I've lost their mind. <laughs> oh yeah, that's that's almost a hundred percent. It's been like I've only heard of one story where someone was like, "I get, I hired an accountant and I let him manage my money." It was like only one person that ever did that. Right. Yeah, and, and it's the same thing. Like, if God is gonna give you something, <laughs> have it for sure that He's gonna prepare you beforehand, because I know for a fact. That if we receive something we're not yet ready for, we're going to lose our mind. <laughs> okay. and, and that's all part of making your sacrifices, you know? I, what are you sacrificing? I'm sacrificing my desires so I can be ready for greater blessings, you know? For example, for myself, and I, yeah. I can tell you guys with confidence, that if more people were to watch me, or if more people uh, were to listen to me, I don't think I would have a good uh, take on my ego. Like, thank you because it's only, <laughs> it's only a three of us. Thank you because it's only not a lot of people that watch me. Um, because I have to, I have to pray for myself every day. Because sometimes I think, wow, I'm doing so good. <laughs> I'm such a good person. <laughs> I'm doing the will of God. And then I feel like I'm, <laughs> I feel like I need to be slapped. Are you the good person? <laughs> Are you the person that's doing what's good? <laughs> or is God the one that gave you the place, the time, the ability, and the, um, the resources to do that? Because that's what it is for sure. You're a good person. <laughs> Santiago, you're a good person. Don't discount your no, but, but, willingness but, 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 to do no, stuff. But, that's, um, that's, that's true, but you always have to understand that our heart is wicked. That's what Jeremiah 17 says. Your heart is wicked beyond belief. <laughs> who can well, understand it? Yeah. And so you have to always like, keep in mind, who am I? What, am, what, is my, what is my heart, right? As you're saying, Evan, what is my heart with this? Am I being humble? Am I understanding where my heart is, where my mind is? Or am I going somewhere completely different? That's, that's why you have to make your sacrifices because it helps you um, get over the small things. It helps you. It, ma, ma, the, the way I put it is um, making the small sacrifices will help you master yourself so that to get you ready to make big sacrifices and you won't fall into that trap. And it's always possible that you might stumble and fall into that trap. That's okay. Pick yourself up. Let it go. Dust yourself off. Keep going. Right. Right. No, and you're right. And that, that does, that's, the, that's the correct um, development of this whole situation. Go ahead. Well, I was thinking like self-criticism, like self-humbling. I feel like it could be a double-edged sword. It's more good than bad. But it can be a double-edged sword as far as I feel like it could stress at least me. Like last week, I feel like I was stressing myself out too much in a way. Like beating myself up. Right. Too much. As in, I always feel like I could do more. But I feel like it's not necessarily about doing more, you know, to, I don't know. But at the same time, it's like I do it to stay grounded and not be so, I don't know, like, hey comfortable yeah i mean i mean sorry 
about this. We're already so off topic anyways. Um, it's kind of like that one parable I think we all really like, which is the parable of the silversmith. To get at, And it goes along with, as I've been saying, make sacrifices. And uh, when you make a sacrifice, that's basically you be throwed it back into the fire to be purified. And um, that, that teaches you a lot. Trust me. Um, yeah. I walk around a lot and I, and I often make friends with all sorts of people. In fact, um, I made friends with a guy that said religion is evil and Satanism makes sense. He never said he was a Satanist, but you'd be the judge. And uh, I learned a lot from him. It wasn't anything good, but I learned a lot from him. <laughs> and the biggest thing I learned from him was to how to see if someone's manipulating you yeah. so don't be afraid to go into the place into places um that aren't exactly great but just be aware and don't take anything personally just see and when it's time to go leave you know yeah yeah i mean no yeah like i just want us to understand that this is a development stage that we're always going to have to go through. We can, we can start something and start it from the greatest place, the greatest spot, right? We have to build ourselves eventually to that so that God will give us what we are going to be responsible with. Yep. If, I can re if I can be responsible with something small, then I'm sure as, I'm sure as heck not going to be able to be responsible with something that's very big. That wouldn't make any sense. In fact, I would be afraid that I could lose myself if I do end up get, receiving something way too big for me. Uh, as, as, as I said, right? And, and I think uh, it's coherent also with the story of Jesus, with the story of Paul and even his disciples. They didn't start at a great position from the beginning. Jesus, to start his ministry, waited until he was 31 or so right that's a lot of time why didn't he start when he was 20 right and then when we look at paul paul after seeing jesus he didn't start his ministry right away and was like acts and craziness no it, it it took him like seven years after that if you guys actually read the epistles and i think some of us forget that it feels like everything is right away and it's is like instant. But no, the life of faith is a process that takes time. Yeah, I'm not trying to stress you out. <laughs> That's not my purpose. That's, and Jesus never wanted that either. But there is something that should give us that. He, he doesn't want us to stress, but we can be set in a comfort zone, right? We have yep. to seek for more. Um, and even, even if it takes time, right? Even God, even if it takes seven more years for me to be ready, then let it be so. Uh, help me not to be stressed about it, but help me go through the process that will prepare me for what you have in store for me. Because that's what I want. That's what I know it's best for my life. Uh, because if I'm not ready for something, <laughs> this is gonna this is gonna end badly. Maybe not even just for me, but for the people that might even start hearing me in the future, right? So. And, and I think some, that's something important to do. And, and we definitely got way out of topic, <laughs> but I think it was important. Um, uh, Jesus did make a great sacrifice for us. And he laid down his life for us. And it wasn't, it wasn't a happy time, right? That's, I think that's also an emphasis that I want to do in this study because that's what we're looking at. This wasn't a happy time for him. Was it a joyful time afterwards? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, if I remember correctly, and I'm sure, I know I'm getting ahead of myself, didn't, didn't, wasn't when the people who saw that he had risen, that didn't they just basically jump for joy and start running around uh, yelling, right. he has risen? Yeah. He has risen. <laughs> and the yeah. first ones to see this were women. It, it's like, yeah, I'm pretty sure, you no, know, it turns out those women were terrified. Oh, no, he's risen. <laughs> and because they were women, they, the, the man didn't believe them. <laughs> yeah. Which I think was funny, but, you know. it's, uh, it's... Women gabbing again. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, that's the truth 
for every sacrifice that you make, I can assure you, it's not going to be fun. It's going to suck. <laughs> it's going to be terrible. <laughs> Dude, I, I have it for sure. Look, I have 80 years of experience in this. Only eight. I'm sure it's going to be more. <laughs> but for now, every time I had to sacrifice something for God, it sucked a lot. But you know what? At the end of it all, when, it, when, when that was done and over with, it was the most wonderful thing, wonderful decision that I could have made. Like literally, I couldn't see my life any other way but that. I'm so glad. Well, first of all, that God helped me through it, <laughs> right? Because I knew I, wa- I didn't want to do it. I got, it got to the point where I wasn't just praying, God, let it be your will. I got to the point where like, God, I just wanted to be done. My will, I wanted to be done. I, I had to like repent from that <laughs> before it was too late. But the fact of the matter is that it's something that is worthwhile. Yeah, the fights get more challenging. Yeah, the, the moments and everything, but it's worth it. And so here at the same time, he says, I also have the power to take it again. He gave down his life on his own. Nobody took it from him. He died in the cross because he wanted to. Because that's what he said, let it be done. Let the will of God be done in my life. But it's not because the Romans were stronger than God. In fact, Jesus talking to to this guy, I forgot his name. He said, If I wanted to, I could call a legion of angels to free me from this. My kingdom is not of this world. And and that's meekness. Because he could could have done it, but he chose not to. Why? Because there's something more important than this right now. And I don't want to kill you people. I just want you to know. Right. You know. And this is the will of God to lay down my life. Um, and I mean, he could have, when they were mocking him at the cross, oh, you, you say you're God, then get out, get down from there, <laughs> save yourself. Right. That was a blasphemy, but he could have done it, but he's not going to listen to these people that are trying to rile him up and have it for sure. During those moments of suffering, people are going to make fun of you for your decision that you're about to do, bro. You, you didn't, you didn't go to sleep with that woman? <laughs> You're so stupid. <laughs> He's spiritually minded, not carnally minded. That's just the summary. Yeah, but I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to prepare myself for the future and you guys for the future. The people yeah. around you are going to make fun of you. And they're going to, what do you call it? Um, mock, 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 mock you, belittle you. But if you have your trust set on God, that doesn't matter. Is it going to hurt? Sure. (laughs) Being mocked is never fun. And uh, especially if it's something that you like too. But it is what it is. Yeah, you think God, you think Jesus had a fun time? I, 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 once again, I'm trying to make too much emphasis. I feel like sometimes I make too much emphasis on something, but I mean, I don't know. That's just me, I guess. Anyways, who, who did he receive this command from? From the Father. This command I have received from my Father, that I may, take, that I may lay down my life and that I may take, take it up again. So this is not of Jesus. This is of God. When, when God tells you to do something, have it for sure. He's going to be there with you. And he's going to give you the ability to do so. It's not going to be you. (laughs) Believe you, me. And actually, not me, but believe Jesus. He's going to be there. But you have to believe. (laughs) You have to believe. He's there for you. So it's really cool. Um, Let's move on to verse 19. What does it say? There was division, therefore, again, among the Jews for, for these sayings. 
Uh, these Basically, dudes... they're like, what does Jesus mean? What does Jesus mean? <laughs> what is he talking about? Crazy man. I mean, no, I think this is really just a division on is he saying the truth or is he saying lies? Yeah, they, they, there was like a, they were divided. They were discussing it like, oh, I think this, I think that. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, you know. As with everything, all of us have our opinions on every matter. <laughs> right. I can tell you I'm a Republican and if you're a Democrat, then you're going to hate me. Or I can tell you I'm a Democrat and you're a Republican and you're going to hate me. Right. It's, it's, it's like, well, honestly, friends. it's not, it's not, it's not too off base. <laughs> <laughs> right. Different mindsets, different perspectives, different lives. If I say that I'm something and you're the other thing, then we're going to have a problem. And uh, it's, it's just like everything. That's why I try not to put my out view on anything. And I try not to have any outlook on anything in this world because it's really pointless. Why would I want to start a strive for a problem with a brother, with a sister and something that has no reason to be there? If, if, if in anything that I might argue, it might be about the word of God. But even then, I feel like, you know, we shouldn't argue anymore. <laughs> let's just let's just pray and let's, let us be like that. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> let God be the work, right? The one that works in us. Because in the end, right, specifically talking about a physical argument about something in the world, it's, it's really meaningless, right? Do, uh, con conspiracy the theories, uh, aliens, dragons. <laughs> I don't know, whatever you want to talk about. Wait a minute, you don't believe in dragons? <laughs> They're everywhere. <laughs> you ever heard of the kimono dragon? That's a dragon. <laughs> Dude, what are those people called? The reptiles? Re reptilians? Oh, the reptilian people, yeah. Anyways, you know, we could talk about so many things. Are there aliens? What happened with, with the dinosaurs? You know, what happened with all that? Dude, what? I'm not here to argue about that. You know, you could have your outlook. I have my outlook. That's fine. But if we're going to talk about something important, let's talk about the gospel. Let's talk about the truth. Right. But even in this habit, for sure, people are going to have their differences. But what you have to have for certain here is if Jesus is your shepherd, then you know the truth. But not because the truth is of yourself, but because the truth is hid. And if you believe in him and you listen to his voice, then there's no reason to argue. Right. If people want to argue with the word of God, and that's them and God, but if you have a problem with God, then that's that's something completely different. Don't have a problem with me, <laughs> you know. Talk to and, God about it. Yeah, and uh, honestly, be uh be discerning whether they're arguing or really confused. Right, that's true. Yeah, that's that's reasonable, and it does take time. Uh, for example, I know that as a child, once you learn something, and even if it's wrong, it's a lot difficult after you grow up to get rid of that thought or that perspective because it's what you grew up with. Um, uh, it doesn't have to be something biblical. It could just be something in the world. Right? If, if, a, if, if a teacher teaches somebody that one plus three is two, <laughs> then the child's going to believe that one plus three is two, <laughs> right? It, so, it sounds like you need to work on your, what is it, what is it that you hate so much? Differ, differentials equations or something? <laughs> we had to logic it proofs. out. Why does one plus one? Yeah, proofs. There we proofs. go. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you work on your proofs. <laughs> right. Yeah. So if this, eventually when this child reaches just addition and, and subtraction, thinking that one plus three is two, and he's gonna be like, wait, what? There's no way one plus three is two. <laughs> and now, you know, if you tell him otherwise, it's difficult, right? And, and I'm talking more so in a spiritual sense too, because that's what happens when it comes to doctrine, um, like catalysism. They're, they're so bound by their traditions, by their rules, that they fail to see the freedom of the gospel. Uh, and that they really, in the end, just became like just the Pharisees. But it's a, it's a matter of, if you know what the source is, then go to the source, get the truth, and believe it. Uh, but if you believe it, know that there's people that are not going to believe it. <laughs> 
So it's up to you, right? But in the end, that's, that's what Jesus has been trying to tell us from the beginning. And that's what we're going to see in John 14. I can't wait for John 14. I don't know if you guys have seen how excited I am for John 14. But he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. Nobody can come through the, to the Father if not through him. So just have that for sure. Our shepherd, our shepherd, our pastor, our Lord, our king, our teacher, our father is Jesus. So, yeah, verse 20. So many of them said, he is possessed and out of his mind. Why listen to him? Yeah, so here we're looking at the first perspective, right? What are they saying? Yeah, he, yeah he's not of God. He's the devil. He's why crazy. Why are we listening to him? Why, why are we listening to him? He's out of, he's out of his mind. <laughs> he's out of his mind. And he has a demon. He's talking about killing himself and then reviving himself? What is this? He's talking about giving us his flesh to eat and his blood to drink? What a madness. Oh, that was last chapter. No. <laughs> Still, it's the same kind of mindset. Yeah, it, it, it's a continuation. Yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, honestly, that would be crazy if you hear somebody in the street saying that. Yeah, don't, what? Jesus wants me to be a cannibal? What? Right. <laughs> but obviously, now we know he's talking spiritually, right? So that's why it's so difficult for somebody that's uh, carnally minded to listen to the words of Jesus because they're not going to comprehend them. So yeah, here's our first perspective. Interesting. <laughs> I think it's funny, but it is what it is. There's going to be people like that. Know that for sure. And then what, is, what does verse 21 say? Others said, these are not the words of him that hath a devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? Which is funny because Jesus answered this question like a couple of verses ago. Not No chap chapters? I don't know. A, a bit ago, because he himself asked, asked us, um, like, you know, um, it doesn't make sense for the king of, for a devil to banish other devils, you know? Yeah. Also, it goes with chapter nine. Um, if yeah. this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Yep. Uh, since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone, that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. Mm-hmm. So it's right for them to say yeah, how these cannot be the words of a demon because <laughs> a demon cannot has never, nobody has ever opened the eyes of a blind person. Uh, also, also uh, the other kind of like snippet about this is why are they specifically saying this at this moment? Like, why are they saying, can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Oh, because they've seen him do it so it's just like because it just happened so be like, yeah, yeah. because it already happened so it just, it's like no it just happened like oh, oh yeah yeah, he's sorry, still, yeah there you go no no he's still continuing from chapter nine this is still yeah, going on he, i think here we have a a concise answer on whether nine was a continue i mean 10 was a continuation of nine or not and it, it is if if it wasn't clear already yeah, it, it's it's kind of like um, people are saying, you know, he he's a he has a devil. Why should we listen to him? And it's just like, well, we all know that the devil has no power over God. So how could a devil outcast another uh, cast out another devil? That doesn't make any sense, you yeah. know. And how can a de a demon open the eyes of the blind? Actually, I wanted to see the the interlinear for this because I want to see if it says devil or demon. I know there is a difference, but I think uh, demons inf uh, possessed people and devils or something else. I'm not quite sure. Well, I, I'll, I'll need to research it because I'm thinking of um, what was it? A man who was possessed by a whole bunch of devils and he's and they begged not to be not to have a vessel so they sent him into pigs 
The drown the pigs. Ooh. From what I read in the Bible, a demon possesses a person and a devil works on the outside to destroy uh, uh, the people. Kind of like how Satan came before God and is like, you know, Job or Job? How do you say that? Job? Job. You know, Job, your servant? Listen, if you let me touch him, he's gonna, he's not gonna follow you anymore. Yep. So, so uh, devils can, can appear to you, but demons will attack you from it within. Yeah. I mean, that's as far as I've, I've known from reading the Bible, right? I, I haven't really read much about demons in any other books or anything like that, but just going through the Bible, that's what I've seen. So, which is why I, I want to know if uh, here it's the translation is from demon or for devil. <clears throat> no, it is da daimon in uh, Greek. Daimon, which is demon. Well, then we're going we're going to end up getting into um, et etymology, the study of the of words. If we if we go back that far. <laughs> no, yeah, no, that's. No, I was looking at the interlinear, like the most because uh, the, the the disciples wrote the New Testament in Greek, so. Yeah. Where do you look for all those? Biblehub.com. Yeah. Bible okay. Hub uh, interlinear, yeah. Okay. Biblehub.com slash interlinear. And then the Old Testament is going to be in Hebrew, obviously, because it was written in Hebrew. But uh, the New Testament, it's in Greek because it was written in Greek. It's important to look at the etymology sometimes, right? Yeah, it, it, it helps, but not for this for this study it would take too long <laughs> right right yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> right but yeah just as a it says I, I know some versions say devil but i i prefer the demon because that's the actual translation i mean that's the actual world they use uh when they wrote it so can a demon open the eyes of the blind no he can just cause mayhem in fact they can actually make you blind <laughs> yeah they cause blindness I mean, it's a miracle, right? <laughs> mm. You went from seeing to being blind. <laughs> or an anti-miracle? How do you call that? <laughs> oh, man. I'm just making up words now. So these are our two perspectives in this situation. As with everything, in any situation, there's going to be people for and against. Um, it's, just, it's just a matter of where you are. Right? What's your side on this? Do you take the side of those that say that he has a demon and it's crazy? Or do you say, dude, if he was a demon, can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Because these are not the words of a demon. And, and, and honestly, it's going to be hard to do, especially depending on the situation. But be as Jesus. Be not, don't be afraid, you know? Right. Um. You're gonna, but you're gonna have to make a choice, right? Your perspective is important in this. Uh, just be sure to make the right choice. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I think that's it for for this for this portion. You guys have any questions, comments, concerns? No, I think I think I've derailed everything enough. Joking, joking. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this time was my fault. <laughs> I'll agree with that. <laughs> yeah, but I have a, a knack for fueling the flames. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It's good, though. I think it, it, uh, it benefited the study. What? Well, I guess uh, I like verse 17. This is why the Father loves me, because I laid down my life in order to take it up again. Right. It, could, it could be translated to, you know, kind of... Letting go of your control. I mean, at least trying to lay down your life for to do God's will versus having doing what you want and feeling like you have full control over your life, you know. So that's well in a in a sense you do because it's either I, I do what is required. Yeah, so I don't, you know, it's like using using the freedom that God gives 
us in the right way, you know. We have the freedom, we have the tools, but we use the tools correctly, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not even correctly, just the best well, like, way. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like uh, I had to do a, a devotional on Monday, and it was in the passage where he says that he gave, to one he gave five talents, to another he gave two, and to another he gave one, right? He told them, be responsible over this amount that I'm going to give you, which is mine, right? And the one that with five used them and gained 10. The one with two used them and gained two more. But the one with one didn't use it. He hid it and he was yeah. only able to give one back. So whose fault was it? If God told you to be responsible with something and he gave it to you, then it's up to you to be responsible with it. And it's fair for yes. him to take it off. If you didn't use it, for him to take it and to <laughs> throw you, basically. Yep. Yeah, and, and that's that's a, a passage that I think a lot of people need to read more because right there, it's like, yes, using God as the master and us as the servants, God gave you something, but what did you do with it? And that's uh, the concept of personal responsibility that I feel is often lacking with not all, but many, but all, yeah. you know? Yeah. Even if it's just one talent that he gives you, use it, <laughs> put it in the bank, as it says in the, in the, in the verse, at least put it in the bank, get some interest on it. So uh, I wanted to say something else, but I forgot what it was. Dang it, Evan, you distracted me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm good at that, too. <laughs> Dang it, Evan. Letting go. Well, what, what did you say at the beginning? I was going to say something about what you said at the beginning. I got to let go of your no, no, control. No, no I was, uh, the father loves me. Because I laid down my life, let me take it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I wanted to say, I want you guys to remember, this is going to happen later in John, well, way later, maybe in two years, <laughs> if we keep at this pace. <laughs> but when Jesus came to Peter, right after he was resurrected, he didn't say, Peter, do you love my sheep? He asked him, Peter, do you love me? Then take care of my sheep, right? If you are a hireling and you take care of the sheep, it doesn't have to be because you love them. In fact, most likely you might not. <laughs> I mean, just look at yourself or just look at somebody else. It's difficult to love another person. If it's difficult to love yourself, then what do you think about other people, right? But what Jesus is asking you is, if you love me, then take care of my sheep. But know in the end that there are his sheep, not yours. Do what's best in your ability. But if you can't do any more, then let it go to God. Don't, don't burden yourself with something that you can't really hold on to. Or don't put, a, don't put a heavy load on yourself. And don't certainly don't put a heavy load on other people. Because that's not what God wants. He gave us a light, light weight, very light. But he nope. he he has given us a weight though. <laughs> so let's not forget that. We still have to carry a backpack here. Uh, but that with that being said, uh, this was a good study. And um, cool. Uh, if one of you want to pray, or I could pray. I'll do it. <clears throat> However you want. Dearly Father, thank you for allowing us to meet here and learn more about your word. Thank you for allowing us to um, take a break from more, some of the more uh, contra uh, controversial parts of the Bible. Thank you for allowing us to find something that we can discuss and agree upon and come together 
and hopefully add to each other's knowledge about. And uh, as we leave here today, please um, watch over us as we go about our businesses. Please help Santiago and Jose. May they um, be uh, do well, at least until next time. And I ask for these things humbly this day. In the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It is not attempt into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Evan. All right, guys. Well, it was, uh, it was a pleasure. Um, see you later. <laughs>